Gramscian reading of Fanon and the Fanonian reading of Gramsci. I will present in broad strokes, of course, only a brief segment of an otherwise massive but ongoing project that, among other things, seeks to mobilize a Gramscian reading of Fanon, as I've already said, and a Fanonian reading of Gramsci by way of examining certain transactions and tensions over-determining and over-determined as they are between certain conceptual configurations charted by Gramsci and Fanon in order to re-theorize the questions of decolonization and national liberation vis-a-vis -vis the question of class struggle in certain parts of what is called the third world that is to say in certain parts of Asia, Africa and Latin America parts their differentia specifica notwithstanding continue to be affected even if variously by their shared history of colonialism and of course by capitalism imperialism and racism profoundly interconnected as they are a point that I repeatedly made for certain reasons that I hope to explain later I should also point out that the project in question is at least partly, partially informed and infected by the specific conjunctural pressures of a particular place, a place extremely ignored within what have come to be known as global studies and even post-colonial studies, a place characterized by the Egyptian political economist Samir Amin as the periphery of the periphery of global capitalism, namely Bangladesh, whose own situation has rendered the points of contact between the two revolutionaries, the two militant praxeologists, if you will, Gramsci and Fanon, productively relevant. Now I move on to stream two of my presentation. In fact, uh, the, our own National Liberation Movement of 1971 shows how the familiar Fanonian questions of decolonization and national liberation as well as the question of class struggle are all profoundly, if not always unproblematically, interla interlinked in a peripheral formation like Bangladesh, a site where decolonization and national liberation are unfinished projects, a point that I already made in the first part of my presentation, and where culture, culture itself continues to be a political economic category and political economy a cultural category, and further where the question of hegemony is not only a cultural question but also a political economic one. Taking cues and clues from the Indian Marxist theorist activist is Azamit's superb article on Gramsci called Fascism and National Culture, reading Gramsci in the days of Hindutva. I want to call attention to Gramsci's relatively ignored formulation, such as, I quote Gramsci here, for though hegemony is ethical political, it must be economic, must necessarily be based on the decisive function exercised by the leading group in the decisive nucleus of economic activity, unquote. Mark the way Gramsci's acute accent falls on what he calls, I quote, the decisive nucleus of economic activity, unquote. For Gramsci, the economic is not just one factor among others, but is fundamental to the functioning of hegemony as Gramsci further asserts, I quote, intellectual and moral reform has to be linked with the program of economic reform. Indeed, the program of economic reform is precisely the concrete form in which every intellectual and moral reform presents itself." Unquote. Indeed, it is this Gramsci with his emphasis on the economic 
let's say, the political economic that receives acute attention from Asia's Ahmed, even when Ahmed dwells on the question and the problematic of national culture in what's called the Third World, reminding one of the African revolutionary Amilcar Cabral's take vis-a-vis -vis national culture itself. Also, more recently, in his outstanding book called The Gramscian Moment, particularly in his long section titled Gramsci, The Economist, Peter Thomas challenges Billy Anderson's old contention that, and I quote Anderson here, Gramsci's silence on economic problems was complete, unquote, and exemplarily shows how, to quote Peter Thomas, quote, of all the figures of so-called Western Marxism, with the possible exception of Adorno, Gramsci demonstrates the most thoroughgoing engagement with and knowledge of supposedly classical Marxist themes derived from the critique of political economy, unquote. And further, some theorists and activists themselves from Asia, Africa, and Latin America have turned with their own southern question, if you will, to this very Gramsci, without, however, by no means de-emphasizing Gramsci's insistence on the power of culture in the realization of a historical social block. This turn to Gramsci, the economist, then, I should point out, is but a reaction, of course, against what Isaac Ahmed calls left-wingish culturalism, and Ahmed here means the culturalist appropriations of Gramsci in many, if not all, domains of cultural studies and post-colonial studies. To quote Ahmed here, Gramsci is represented as the theoretician of cultural superstructures with such extremity that any idea of structure as the condition of possibility and the limiting horizon of that superstructure simply disappears. Left-wingish culturalism then can be posited as an autonomous realm with no necessary relation with class politics, for instance, unquote. But Gramsci, to put it bluntly and categorically, is about, among other things, I quote, the intersection of economic, political, and cultural processes, unquote, to use Marcus Green's words from his preface to his superb and extremely useful anthology called Rethinking Gramsci. And with this very intersection, one that obviously bespeaks and attests to what Green continues to accentuate as Gramsci's characteristic interdisciplinarity or his interdisciplinary way, and for that matter, the question of enacting a productive dialectic between culture and political economy, a dialectic that I argue combats both culturalism and economism in theory and practice, it remains at the core of the Marxist idea of a permanent cultural revolution in Asia, Africa, and Latin America as a persistent, united front, and even militant praxis that reckons political economy, among other things, as a site of cultural interventions in the interest of building a new socialist culture." Unquote. It's with this turn to Gramsci, prompted as it is by the actually existing anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist movements on the periphery and the periphery of the periphery, movements that clearly suggest how decolonization and national liberation in the era of US imperialism remain unfinished projects, although the whole notion of national liberation has been redefined by theorists like Isa Ahmed and our own Badr Dinamor, and of course also show how the questions of decolonization and national liberation and class trouble are all profoundly interlinked that my project examines and interrogates certain productively relevant points of contact between Gramsci and Fanon, particularly, if not exclusively, the Fanon of the wretched of the earth, while of course remaining critical of the cultural culturalist appropriations of Fanon himself, like Gramsci, in certain areas of post-colonial studies that have hitherto remained, by and large, inattentive to Fanon's own kind of engagement with political economy itself, a political economy of racism and colonialism, for instance. 
of course, the most recent anthology of essays on Gramsci called the Post-Colonial Gramsci, edited by Nilam Srivastava and Goydik Ortacharya, examines certain connections between Gramsci's concept of the organic intellectual and Fanon's notion of the colonized and native intellectual in terms of the centrality both Gramsci and Fanon ascribe to the connection between the intellectuals and the masses in the construction of a truly emancipatory movement for national liberation which depends on the development of a strong national hyphen popular culture, although the phenomenon of the political economy of colonialism and racism remains absent in this otherwise useful anthology. Even when in that very anthology, Partho Chatterjee's own essay, in his own way, political economizes Gramsci, if you will, by dwelling on the micrologics and macrologics of what has been called post-colonial capitalism in India within the Gramscian framework of passive revolution. Taking lessons from both Gramsci and Fanon, one can say that what we say, a point that I already made, what we say and what we do not say, what we reveal and what we conceal or repress, what we emphasize and what we de-emphasize are by no means neutral. I intend to turn to some of these issues later if time permits, but let me make a few more observations, rather quick observations, about certain points of contact between Gramsci and Fanon. Indeed, what are obviously Fanonian about Gramsci? or what obviously make Gramsci a kind of a political, political theoretical predecessor of Fanon are Gramsci's own theory of Italian colonialism, even internal colonialism, as particularly, if not exclusively exemplified in Gramsci's 1926 unfinished essay called Some Aspects of the Southern Question, and the prison notebooks Gramsci's critique of the so-called civilizing mission, and of course Gramsci's suggestion that anti-colonial national liberation movements are signs of an achieved political maturity, although national liberation is not automatically a revolution, according to both Gramsci and Fanon. I should parenthetically point out here that we find Gramsci analyzing even Italian colonialism itself from the perspectives of the former colony of Albania, and of course, commenting on British and American imperialism, as well as the history of Italian-English involvement in Ethiopia, Somalia, the Yemen, Egypt, China, India, and even Palestine. This particular country is not well known, generally. Further, contrary to Stuart Hall's old and by now well-challenged contention that, to quote Hall himself, I quote, actually Gramsci does not write about racism and does not specifically address those problems, unquote. What is obviously phenomenal about Gramsci is Gramsci's theoretical, theoretically and politically significant engagement with the questions of race and racism and their connections to colonialism. Here, I cannot help quoting at some length from Timothy Brennan's Gramscian book called Wars of Position. I quote, far from a passing interest, race preoccupied Gramsci. The problem of race and colonialism is literally everywhere in the prison notebooks and deeply inflects the political writing and early journalism. Gramsci's analytical interest in problems of ethnicity and color can also be seen in his discussion of Maurice Murray's The Twilight of the White Races, a book published in 1929, which is only one of several popular treatises forecasting the decline of Europe in the face of the colonial uprisings that accompanied the Russian Revolution. Murray specifically accentuated the anti-colonial dynamic unleashed by the Russian Revolution. Indeed, race very often makes its appearance in the guise of the psychology of colonialism, which had been of interest to Gramsci even as a 20-year-old boy in Dubin, unquote. Owing to time constraints, by the way, I have to leave out here quite a cluster 
of interconnected textual readings of both Gramsci and Fanon, and thus I will be making certain points quite categorically and admittedly even sweepingly. In fact, I'll make three points. Three points. First, the question of race again. All right, the question of race. If one carefully reads Gramsci's notes on race and the Southern question and his essay already mentioned, it's called Some Aspects of the Southern Question, it's possible to see that like Fanon and like others in what's called the revolutionary black tradition from say Du Bois to Davis, Gramsci does not reckon race as such as a mere analytical category in isolation, but he seems to be dwelling on the logics of racism as the Puerto Rican rhetorician and theorist of racism, Victor Vianova says, it not, it's not just race, but racism, stupid. Taking racism as almost a system of not only domination, but also exploitation. I should again quickly point out here that Fanon's essay called Racism and Culture, relatively under-engaged as it is, this clearly, clearly shows that in contrast to the apologists of the neoliberal free market system, the apologists of the neoliberal free market system who reduce racism to a case of individual mental illness or syndrome, Fanon posits racism as a historically produced, deeply localized and globalized system of domination and exploitation. But both Fano and Gramsci don't merely dwell on racism as an absolute autonomous system of domination and exploitation as such. But Gramsci, very much like Fano himself, connects it to the logics of colonialism itself. Thus it is possible to speak of a racist colonialism and colonialist racism, the Gramscian Fanonian way, for instance. And both Gramsci and Fanon do not stop there. Of course, they further connect racism and colonialism to capitalism itself, to the uneven development of capitalism in point of fact, to show, for instance, to use Gramsci's own words, I quote, how the North, in concrete terms, was a tentacular parasite that became rich at the expense of the South, unquote. That's Gramsci. Let me make here a related point quickly. Before Fanon could famously say, as he did in The Wretched of the Earth, that, I quote, Europe, Europe is literally the creation of the third world, unquote. Gramsci himself said this his own way, if you dare to reread Gramsci's prison writings, particularly his piece called The Colonial Populations, in which, for instance, Gramsci maintains, and I quote Gramsci here, the colonial populations have become the foundation on which the whole edifice of capitalist exploitation is erected. These populations are required to donate the whole of their lives to the development of industrial civilization. For this, they can expect no benefit in return. Indeed, they see their own country systematically despoiled of their natural resources, unquote. Again, that was Gramsci. Gramsci even goes to the extent of suggesting that the overthrow of capitalism, capitalism should logically begin in the colonies, as he maintains, I quote Gramsci again, by freeing themselves of foreign ex capitalist exploitation, the colonial populations would deprive the European industrial bourgeoisie of raw materials and foodstuff and bring down the centers of so-called civilization that have lasted from the fall of Roman Empire, unquote. Gramsci. But that, however, was not an argument as some Gramsci scholars have already suggested to which Gramsci would seriously return later. It is here where this very Gramsci, I argue, can be complemented and even extended by Fanon, particularly the Fanon of the Wretched of the Art, a politically charged and explosive and theoretically engaged epical work, which is not only about the tactics and strategies of decolonization as a violent phenomenon, to use Fanon's own words, but also about actively charting out 
the critical contours and coordinates of what might be called a political economy of racism and colonialism in the interests of anti-colonial national liberation and even anti-capitalist struggles. Struggles that, however, do not end in themselves, but struggles whose, I quote, strategic persistence, rather permanence, would then lead to the revolutionary transformation of the colonized slash neo-colonized land and body of the southern peasants and workers, unquote. So I have already made certain connections between Gramsci and Fanon, but let me take up my second point, and this point involves the question, did Fanon read Gramsci? Did Fanon actually read Gramsci? Neelam Srivastava writes, I quote, translations of Gramsci's writings did not appear in France until 1953 and 1955. 1955 was the year in which a selection of Gramsci's writings appeared in French journal called Europe. This was an excerpt of Gramsci's longer work called, in English translation, Intellectuals and the Organization of Culture, and focused on the role of the intellectual in political and cultural organization. Thus, it is possible that Fanon could have read these texts and may have had them in mind when he prepared his talk called On National Culture, presented in 1959 at the Second International Congress of Black Writers and Artists in Rome, unquote. Now, like Srivastava, I too hold that Fanon's piece called On National Culture, in fact a lecture, a lecture that was later included as a chapter in his The Wretched of the Art, evinces quite some striking similarities and links with the Gramscian understanding of the national popular culture. What further emerges is nothing short of a striking parallel between Gramsci's theorization of post-unification in Italy and Fanon's reflections on the so-called post-colonial social formations in the wake of so-called national liberation. There are other related points here, but I'll skip them. In fact, I will make quite a conceptual leap here and make my third, rather last point a broad point in point of fact. Okay then, let me, let me now put it this way. The Brazilian, the Brazilian Marxist theorist activist, Carlos Nelson Coutinho, himself impressively stresses in his book called Gramsci's Political Thought, relatively recently translated into English, the point that Gramsci, no matter what he does, ascribes a fundamental importance, even centrality, to politics. Stressing this point then, a Gramscian reading of Fanon and a Fanonian reading of Gramsci, that is to say, at least a reading, Gramsci with Fanon's agendas of decolonization and national liberation in mind, among other Gramscian, Fanonian, conceptual constellations, of course, variously reveal that the tricontinental, to use Che Guevara's term, rather the international task of building an anti-colonial and anti-racist socialist hegemony involves at least four material sites of life and death struggles of the global oppressed, the true 99%. And these four crucial sites are I mentioned them already and I repeat, I'm repeating deliberately because I've hardly done justice to those four sites. You know, there will be two other lectures, I'll, I'll be bringing up more issues in connection with those four sites. So these four sites are land, labor, language and the body, interconnected as they are. Let me repeat, land labor, language, and the body. In fact, stretching both Gramsci and Fanon, one might say that there is no emancipation of humanity without the emancipation of labor, the emancipation of land, the emancipation of language, and the emancipation of the body from capitalism, imperialism slash colonialism, racism, patriarchy, and other forms and forces of oppression and exploitation. 
come towards the end. And let me end my presentation with a short poem. A poem by the Arab Marxist writer Sharif Atikullah, a poem in my own English translation in collaboration with Mukarram Mahmood. The poem is titled Praxeologics. It's a political poem. You know, and it comes so close to my own engagements with theory. I mean, nice poem. It is very difficult to translate this. I'm not very satisfied with this translation. I'll read this, share this with you. <coughs> And in fact, using Fano's own term, one might say that Atikullah's poem is a combat poem. Didn't Fano speak of this combat stage in this anti-colonial movement? Combat stage is a combat poem, a poem that alludes to Gramsci and Fano, and also to Fano's Marxist guru, Aimé Césaire, the great Caribbean poet and theorist. Okay, here is the poem, and with this poem I end my short lecture, relatively short lecture here. Mariam, tell me Mariam, tell me, is blood the only thing that flows back and forth? See how the fascist drenches the moon with blood. See how history becomes a snare or a ghost walk. See how theories segregate and yawn in the middle of that unfolding of love and life. See how all the tyrants resemble one another. Mariam, Mariam, Mariam. See, see how you and I and she and he and they and we keep clinging onto that horizon of stories that recedes and fades. See, your body is not yours. See, your land is not yours. See, your language is not yours. Yet, life is an unending quest. Why write this damn poem? No one has asked me for it. Yet, I will write. We will write. Rub words together such that they catch fire and carry the symphonies of history. We explode. We erupt. We are the fire. We are the sea. The world is dissolving. The world is yet to be born. We are the world. And we are yet to be born. Thank you.